some of you have heard me tell this. I was at an event shortly after I was elected, and I had to have with me um, my, uh, one of my kids, who was then a freshman in high school. I, I think I had to drop him off somewhere afterwards. And he was listening to one of these intros, and somebody mentioned some award that I received. And afterwards, he asked me completely seriously, that's not like a real award you won. They just gave it to you because of your job, right? <laughs> and I was like, sort of like deflated. I thought like, I guess he's right. I mean, <laughs> and he followed with, it's not like winning the sexiest freshman swimmer on the Pioneer High School swim team, right? Which he, of course, won. And, 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 and I thought, God grant me the confidence of a 15-year-old boy one day, <laughs> one day. <laughs> um, thank you very much for um, having me here today um, to something that means so much to me. Thank you to all my friends from LSC for um, making a big splash in Ann Arbor this weekend about a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, the National Center for State Courts measures public opinion every year about our state courts. They ask the public what they think about um, how we're doing. And every year, the public tells uh, the National Center that the thing they're most worried about is access. Um, and uh, for those of us in the justice delivery business, um, this keeps us up at night um, for good reason. Their homes, their families, their health, their safety, and their jobs are at stake in our civil justice system. And as everyone has already said so eloquently today, equal justice is at the heart of the American promise to each of our citizens, not just some of our citizens. Uh, the Michigan Supreme Court has constitutional oversight of the courts of the state. So everybody's familiar with our decision-making function. We hear cases, decide them, issue opinions. That's something everybody knows a little bit about. But we also have this administrative role by the Constitution, which says that we are charged with the administration of the courts of the state. That, to me, means it's our job to make sure we're delivering on equal justice, equal justice to all. And I promise you, we're working on it. Um, I won't, you're going to hear a lot about two specific um, examples of that today. And the folks who get credit for that are the folks you're going to be hearing from, the lawyers, the judges, and the community um, organizers and activists. They're the ones that get credit for it. We're lucky at the Michigan Supreme Court to be able to support um, them in that work. Um, but we at the court have stood up an Access for All task force that has ambitious goals. Uh, and just won a competitive grant from the National Center because of the amazing work being done by Jennifer Bentley and Angela Tripp. Uh, they, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have them uh, leading the way. Uh, we have an, an ongoing elder abuse task force that we're working together with the Attorney General looking at how to improve service for our seniors in our courtrooms. Uh, Michigan Legal Help is expanding its um, presence into pla other places where people need it so they don't have to just find it in courthouses or in libraries. I, just recently, uh, uh, the Secretary of State agreed to put us on her little electronic board because apparently people are stuck there for a little more than 30 minutes still. Uh, and so it's another way to get them information. We have um, online dispute resolution now in 17 counties, free and available anytime a litigant can access a phone or a computer. We have more veterans treatment courts in Michigan than any court, any state in the country. We are um, providing treatment courts to every single citizen, no matter where they are. Um, we are tackling the opioid crisis in our courts because uh, until and unless anybody else does, we have these people, they're showing up in our dockets, and we're going to take responsibility for it. We are pushing the ball, the boulder, I should say, up the hill. Um, but here's what I spend a lot of time thinking about lately. I co-chair a task force with the lieutenant governor on jail populations. Um, like everywhere else, Michigan's jail populations have grown exponentially over the last 30 years. They've sort of outpaced um, our, our population at, by a factor of seven to one. Crime, on the other hand, is at a 30-year low. Um, data is always a problem in um, criminal justice, and so we are lucky enough to have um, a significant grant from the Pew Charitable Trust which is gathering the data for us. So we finally, for the first time, we'll have a sense of who, who are those folks and why are they there and what else can we be doing um, about that. Um, the, 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 the problem is one, um, it's sort of one of these, these traditional collective action problems. You can assume all of the people who contribute to it are acting in good faith. I do. Uh, state legislatures have passed uh, statutes over the year that have requ required jail time um, or um, uh, custody for certain offenses. They did that in good faith. Police officers and sheriffs are out 
uh, exercising their authority in good faith when they come across people violating those statutes. Um, judges acting in good faith are making determinations on a case-by-case basis, sometimes without very much information about whether someone is um, safe to be released. Prosecutors and defense attorneys in good faith are making decisions about how to um, represent everybody's interest in those cases. And at the same time, because all of these people act in good faith, but in silos, we have what um, even uh, not just experts, but the public views as uh, somewhat of a crisis that needs our attention. And we are lucky here in Michigan to have a bipartisan, um, multi-government uh, level. We have state, uh, all of the major statewide electeds, the Republican leadership in the legislature, the Democratic governor and myself, all of the sheriffs and the Michigan Association for Counties together in this agreement with Pew. And the folks on the task, for the, for, t- folks on the task force represent even more stakeholders. We have victims of crime. We have people who are incarcerated. We have prosecutors, we have all levels of law enforcement, defense attorneys. But our access to justice efforts have to take aim, in my view, about um, at the way the civil legal problems push people into jails and prisons and vice versa. We can't silo our civil justice efforts from our criminal justice efforts. We can't anymore. They're not siloed for our clients. I was at a symposium on Monday um, at NYU on Professor Barkow's new book on uh, the politics of incarceration. And Sean Hopwood, who's a um, compelling speaker at, and also a law professor at Georgetown University, <coughs> told a story that he just heard from a police officer in, D- in DC recently. A police officer pulled over a driver who had, no, who had a suspended driver's license, um, or actually had no driver's license. Um, And when he ran his criminal history, the man had had 12 or 13 um, arrests for that same offense, driving without a license. And he, the police officer said he just, he he, he wasn't sure why, but he said to the driver, why do you keep doing this? Like, what's, what's going on? And the driver responded in breaking out in tears and said, I would love to take the test, but I can't read. And he was driving to work, like he was, you know, every other time he was pulled over. When he gets out of jail, he's still not going to be able to read, and he's still going to have to get to work, and he still needs to support his family, and he still needs um, his public housing. These problems are interconnected for our clients, and they have to be interconnected as we think about solutions. When people are released from jail, their mental health conditions and substance abuse conditions are still with them. They are still going to struggle with those same issues in their housing and with their families. I don't know if any of the other um, uh, older people in the room like me remember this um, piece that the Austin Surratt, who's a political scientist at Amherst, wrote back in one of the Yale Law Journals, I think in 1991, called The Law is All Over. Paul Rankel probably remembers that. Yep, I figured. Um, The title came from something... um, Uh, that a young man on public assistance said to Surratt. He said, for me, the law is all over. I'm caught, you know. There's always some rule that I'm supposed to follow, some rule I don't even know about that they say. It's just different, and you can't really understand. And Surratt's piece was about the pervasiveness and obtrusiveness of legal rules and practices in the lives of people on public assistance. It's 30 years later. I wake up every day more sure that our access to justice efforts need to be broader and more imaginative and less siloed than even the most innovative among us are now thinking. Our task force on criminal justice is going to succeed because we got rid of the silos and got around one table. We need arrest diversion for people with mental health and substance abuse disorders to be sure, but the diversion needs to then also wrap around civil justice assistance too. And our access to civil justice, likewise, has to have access to diversionary criminal justice practices, too. We need to start speaking the same language. The law is all over, and we need justice to be all over. Thank you all for everything you're doing to make sure that that happens, and thank you for including me in this event today. I appreciate it.